couple of thoughts before starting back into material. One is second midterm exam is on Monday. Not a surprise, Dur during class, one o'clock. Um, I, as usual, encourage you to take the old midterm twos um, as practice. What else? Um, I will move my Monday office hours, which are normally in the afternoon, I'll move them into the morning, 9 to 11, over in Alderman Cafe, because no one wants to come to office hours right after the test. So, and you may well have last minute questions, so I'll be there. All right? I think that does it. Oh, oh, last thing is content. I, I'm, I'm not going to get past balls, balls in air, which, is, which I'll do today, I'll, I'll, at least as much of it as I can. Nothing from airplanes. I mean, if, if, if it, yeah. There, there won't be airplane questions on the exam. Any other questions before I move on? Stuff. OK. So talking about garden watering, which is a context in which I sort of you look at the, the flow of real fluids in real situations, which means that you can't ignore viscosity, the fact that water is, doesn't flow perfectly, uh, perfectly freely. It, it rubs against itself, uh, that when fluids flow around bends and stuff. The, the, path, the paths change, their pressures change, too. The fluid, the fluid is using pressure gradients to, 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 to steer itself. It develops pressure gradients, and so it gets weird things uh, in the flow. And what else? OK, so, so I hope those are, you know, you're comfortable with those, those ideas. Uh, next thing I want to go on to is the idea that the, the flows, when fluids move, they're not always perfectly laminar. They don't, always have streamlines where you can follow the path, a consistent path along the fluid, and it's always the same, unchanging. The fluid can become turbulent. The fluid flow can become turbulent. And so to look at, at sort of, you, you've seen this, but, but you know, where does it come from? And so that's sort of where I left off, is, is turbulent flow, uh, which is associated with, with chaos and the, the butterfly effect. You've, heard, you've surely heard the idea that, that that a butterfly flapping its wings can, uh, you know, s somewhere in the, the southwest or somewhere like that can influence the entire weather pattern somewhere a couple months down the road. It, that, that, that its little, little behaviors can have, have global consequences. This is associated with turbulent flow. That turbulent flows, they, the, the very slight changes in the situation can cause dramatic changes downstream. And where do you get turbulence? And turbulence shows up in systems where the flow becomes dominated by inertia, as opposed to what? As opposed to dominated by, by viscosity. Viscous forces tend to order the, the fluid flow. The fluids, if, 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 if all the layers or, or, or portions of a fluid flow going through a, let's think water in a, in a, in a hose, if all the layers of water are moving along and at different, somewhat different velocities, they rub on each other. And they rub by way of viscous forces associated with viscosity. And the more viscous the water is, so you replace it with uh, honey instead of water, that those forces get stronger. And the ordering effects that show up because the, the, piece, the different portions of water want to travel at the same speed and same direction, the ordering effects get stronger. So viscosity order, tends to order a flow get everybody moving together as a team, simple, predictable. That's, so viscosity is the, is, is the proponent of laminar flow. Inertia supports turbulent flow. Why? Because if you get portions of the fluid really coasting along with lots of, lots, each with its own portion of momentum, and they get determined to go, one go this way, one go that way, they'll rip apart and make a mess. So inertia favors, favors turbulent flow. If you try to keep the flow, for example, ordered as it goes around a rock in your little pond in your backyard, you've got water flowing along, tries to go around the rock to get the, the flow on, on one side and the flow on the other side to sort of stay in sync with each other and, and meet back up properly. It's really tough because the water, the viscosity is struggling to try to keep all the layers under control and it loses them. So, Inertia tends to favor, favors turbulence. I hope that's tolerable. 
So there is a number, and it's, it's truly a number. It's called Reynolds number. There is a, there is a, a number that predicts whether a flow is going to be laminar or turbulent. And it's, it's a ratio. It's a ratio of inertial effects in the numerator to viscous effects in the, the denominator. So everything that, that helps inertia goes up on top. Everything that helps uh, viscosity goes on the bottom. And when you take that ratio, you get a number. And the number, when it's big, means inertia one, and you get turbulence. When the number is small, it means viscosity one, and you get laminar flow with pretty good probability. And the things that go in the numerator of the Reynolds number are the things that favor inertia. A dense, the density of the fluid, that is how much mass it has per drop, because more massive means more, more inertia. Um, so density is up there. The speed of the fluid flow is up there in the numerator. The faster you're going, the more inertia just barrels ahead and does stuff. And the size of the obstacles you're encountering, the, the length of the, uh, from side to side of the obstacles, the bigger the obstacles the flow is encountering, the, the more inertia can, can really mess up the flow. And then in the, in the denominator, it's just viscosity. The more viscous the fluid is, the more viscosity manages to keep the fluid orderly. So the Reynolds number is just this, that ratio. And if you don't remember the exact contents of the ratio, it's OK. It just gives you a, a, a sort of a rule of thumb of where, where you're going to be in the, in, the, in the world of, is it laminar or is it turbulent? And quantitatively, it comes out to about 2,000 being the threshold for transition. Above 2,000-ish, you tend to get turbulent. Below 2,000-ish, you tend to get laminar flow. And having said that, I can, sort of, I can, I can try to show this to you in <coughs> the flow of basically a water past a, 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 a sticks, you know, sticks like this. I've got a, cont a container of essentially a watery fluid that has, that, that sort of shows you local movement. It's kind of, um, it's, a, it's, it's a rheological fluid. What does that mean? It's, it's, it's kind of got some iridescency look to it. And if I go, if I move the fluid past the obstacle, slowly the Reynolds number is small because the speed is small, um, the viscosity is able to keep everything together. So I move the move, fluid goes past the obstacle slowly, laminar. This fluid goes past the obstacle fast, you get turbulent. And the transition is about at, with, with obstacles the size of your finger in water, it turns out that the transition is somewhere around like this. If you go like this with your finger through water, you'll tend to get laminar flow. And, and I'm now moving the obstacle rather than moving the fluid, but it doesn't matter. Whether I move the fluid past a stationary obstacle or whether I move a, stationary ob a moving obstacle through a stationary fluid, it's the same situation, just viewed differently. So I'm going to move sort of stick-like things through the water. Slowly, we get laminar flow. Fast, you get turbulent flow. And you've seen this before. You know, when you stir coffee, if you stir slowly with a spoon, you get laminar flow, and it doesn't mix very well. You know, when you want to stir, stir, I don't know, creamer into your coffee or your tea or something, or milk in your, you, you want turbulence. It's, it's the mixer. And you don't go slow. You go a little bit, you, you know, by, by long experience. You stir it about like that, you get turbulent flow, it mixes up nicely, whoosh. You go too slow, and it's just sort of making pretty swirls, but, but they are not, it's not turbulent. So I'm going to try to look down at this fluid from above. We'll see whether, da, 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 document, camera, there. And we are looking down on it. I, super great optical systems here. How do I turn the light on? Lamp? The lamp is on. All right. So you're looking at the fluid. If I, t if I use a small obstacle, so here's a small obstacle, and I go really slowly through it, we should get laminar flow around, and you should basically see no swirl, very few swirls. The fluid should just work its way around that and come back together pretty well. God, it's not very convincing one way or the other. You can't see very much. Um, it, it, I can see it. 
We, you know, with different years, we have different cameras. This camera, meh, can't really see much. I'm seeing what is called a vortex street, which is this, this pattern of a swirl of top, swirl of bottom, swirl of top. It's, it's, it's orderly, but, but complicated. And that shows up in the early transition towards turbulent. It's not very convincing. Let me try once more and see. So it's characteristic of a small Reynolds number, but not super small. There's, there's a, 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 a wavy pattern to it, but it's, it's not officially turbulent. If I go bigger obstacle and go faster, now I get turbulence. The whole thing is full of swirls and vort vortices, big mess. And the pattern just breaks up into, into just swirling eddies. And even if you can't see it here, you know, it's, it is what it is. Um, it's hard, to, it's hard to demonstrate it well. Uh, you've seen it in real life. You've watched water in a stream. And I've got, put photographs in the book. I, 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 for a long period, I would go through life sort of looking at, oh, that's a good photograph for the book. Uh -huh. and you go, you go hover over it. But it's like walking around near streams. I would often do this. When the stream is flowing fairly smoothly past rocks that are not too big, you can, see the, it, you can still see through the entire thing. It's all clear water flowing along, staying orderly, reproducible, the flow keeps doing the same thing second after second. It goes a little bit faster over, and or over bigger obstacles and suddenly that smooth flow pattern just breaks up into, into, into swirling eddies and, and vortices. Vortices being these tor little tornadoes. And you can't see the wa through the water so well anymore because it's full of uh, Air, for example, gets, gets whipped into it. It's all turbulent. Is that okay? The idea that you get turbulence at high speed around big obstacles with low viscosity, for example. All right. Um, it will show up shortly in the flow of air around things. Air, we've done water so far, and water, when it's going slowly, get, you, you can easily get laminar flow, and life is simple. Air, on one hand, has a much smaller density than water. And that by itself, it's less dense than water by like about a factor of a thousand. So that dramatic drop in density means inertia is having trouble. And that's, that by itself would favor laminar flow. However, the viscosity of air is, is, is significantly smaller still. The, the viscosity of air is much smaller than the viscosity of water. And that dominates it. It turns out that air has trouble staying laminar in its flow. It tends to break up into turbulence very easily. You've seen this turbulence everywhere. You've seen it in the swirling mess that's behind a car that drives by. It's a little less obvious behind balls, but you'll see it's, it's behind all the balls that you ever play with when you throw them to the air. There's a swirling mess of turbulence behind the ball. Or when you go running or, or car driving by, it's all turbulent mess behind that, okay? So that's, that's part of where we're going with that. Last thing to, to, uh, to talk about in the world of garden watering, just for fun and games here. Um, I've, I've paid attention primarily at this, to this point about with flows that are ongoing. They, they, they started before the story, before I began the story, and they continue after the story's over. So we're just watching a flow continue. But what about if you start and stop flows? Well, that, I mean, which happens all the time in the, in, in, when, you, when you work with plumbing. So you start the flow with a, open the faucet, close the faucet. When you open the faucet, the water has to get moving. And so there's a, a gradual investment of momentum into the water to get it. It's got mass. It's got velocity as, it, as the velocity picks up. So the momentum picks up. So when you open the faucet, the water requires momentum. When you close the faucet, the, the momentum has to go away. And how it goes away can lead to interesting effects. So picture this. Picture, picture a long pipe with a, with a valve at the end. And you open the valve at the end, the water begins moving through the pipe and going off, I don't know, wherever it's going to go, out, out the other end of the valve or the faucet. And you got this whole cylinder of water moving forward, chock full of forward momentum. And now you close the valve or faucet at the end. And you do it quickly. Well, that whole column of moving water carrying with it all that momentum has to come to a stop very fast. 
it has to transfer all its momentum to the pipe, and particularly to the valve, because the, 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 most of the pipe is, is, is uh, oriented the wrong direction. It's, it's, it can't push on the water very easily. The valve is at the end where it can push backwards nicely. So, so forces exerted on the sides of the pipe don't help. It's the end. So the whole column of water has to stop by, by way of a backward push from the valve itself. And the force necessary to stop a big column of water that's moving fast can be huge. And so the valve pushes back hard on the water column. It's, it's, like, it's like pushing back, trying to stop a hammer. It's called a water hammer. Pushing back on that column of water, it has to push back hard. And as it pushes back, the pressure, it, pu it's, it actually pushes back by way of pressure. The pressure at the front of the column of water surges upward to create a pressure gradient from high pressure in front, low pressure back, to push the water backwards and stop its motion. So the pressure at the front can surge to, to, to astronomical values, just huge values, and it can blow up the pipe. So there are maybe apocryphal stories, typically set at college campuses where the deal is everybody opens the faucet in the dormitory at, at, so the water is just rushing through all the plumbing. And then right when the bell tower rings noon or something like that, everybody closes the faucets and stops this entire column of water and blows up the plumbing. Now, whether it's ever actually happened, I don't know. I do know that in downtown Charlottesville, at sort of the Five Points area where, where Ridge McIntyre crosses Main Street, there, there, there's a fire station there. They were doing fire testing, I don't know, 10 years ago or something. They were, they were running the, the uh, fire hydrants wide open for a while, and then they, they, they closed the fire hydrants too abruptly. And an old piece of pipe that had been there for decades, millennia, you know, generations, uh, exploded. It, it blew the pipe up. The, this, the impact, that water hitting the end of the pipe. Surge in pressure blew out the sides. You okay with, with why the pressure surges up as the water has to stop? So I can show you this effect two ways. It's a little exotic or esoteric how this is going to work. There's water inside this glass container. And the, the, the top structure is fancy for reasons that I'm not even sure I could tell you exactly. Basically, it's a water-filled tube. Uh, but the water ends here. You see it swimming down there at the bottom, I guess. If I accelerate the tube downward, I'm going, to make the, I'm going to push downward on the tube. I can't touch the water. I can touch the tube. I'm going to shove the tube down. The water, being, wanting to be inertial, and apart from gravity, gravity's not important in the story. The water's going to want to just sit there doing what it was doing, and what's going to happen is the glass is going to accelerate downward, leaving the water unaccelerated. So the water is going to sit there, and it's going to rise up into the top of the tube briefly. It's going to get left behind. So it's going to go up toward the top of the tube, and that by itself isn't, isn't interesting. It happens very, it's very brief. Up it goes. But it compresses air up in the top because there is air inside this. So it's going to compress the air in the top of the tube, and it's going to leave an empty space at the bottom of the tube. Nothing. No, no air. I mean, it's a little water vapor, but, but basically empty at the bottom. So the tube is going to go down and leave the water in this weird situation where it's got compressed air above it and nothing below it, which is a big pressure gradient, a pressure, pressure imbalance. And then I'm going to stop pushing down on the tube and let it coast. And the pressure imbalance will cause the water to accelerate toward the bottom of the tube, pick up speed, and hit the bottom of the tube hard. So far, we OK? And you'll hear it. just water and glass, and yet I can make a tapping sound. And if I do this hard, it will break the bottom of the bottle, the bottom of the glass. So this is not the first one of these we've had. Oh, this is, this is fun, smack, okay, knock the bottom out, okay? So that's, that's water hammer, that's the impact of water on, on, on the end of a pipe, transferring momentum very abruptly by way of a huge force. Okay with that? Now, in honor of it being Wednesday, right before the start of the weekend on Thursday, here's something to do to entertain your friends. And the idea is this. Root beer, OK? Um, I've refilled it with water. The beverage is gone. I wonder where it went. Um, 
So it's refilled with water. There's a gap of air at the top and a, and a, and a, and a top. I put the top back on deliberately because we trap the air in there. And when I accelerate this down, it's the same thing. The water's gonna get left behind. It's gonna compress the air in the top and leave nothing below it. And when I stop accelerating the glass downward, the pressure imbalance will cause the, the water to catch up with the bottom. Yeah, Wes? Um, <coughs> This is exactly the same. It does create a vacuum bubble at the bottom, but we're going cr to promptly crush that vacuum bubble out of existence by having the water catch up with it. Is that OK? So it's the same effect as if you smack it. I'm, gonna, I'm not going to smack it with my hand. I've done this with my hand. It creates red marks on my hand. And you can actually do it without even the cap. I've seen people do this. And it creates donut marks on your hand. And I don't feel like wearing any of those for a couple weeks. Okay. So I'm going to use a mouth. <laughs> so the, the point of this is, is when you hit the top of a bottle, you expect the top of the bottle to be in jeopardy. That's not what's in jeopardy here. It's the bottom of the bottle that's going to get hit by the water as it catches up. You OK with that? <laughs> Someone want to do the second bottle? Yes. Sam. So your, your, your mission, you got to hold, hold, the, hold the bottle yeah. firmly in your hand because gotcha. you don't want to knock it out of your hand. Hold that over there so, you can, so the water goes somewhere. And smack the top firmly with a mallet. You can hear it. There you go. Yay. <laughs> Thanks. So now you know what to do with, on the way to the recycling. All right? And you, you, you're okay with the idea of why it happened? <coughs> I do remember one time at the grocery store, a woman unloading her cart to, to check out, and she lifted up some bottles and hit and clipped the under part of the, of the counter with, with one of the bottles. And whether, whether you s hold the bottle and smack the top or whether you move the bottle and, and run it into something, same effect. The bottom of the bottle blew out, and she was just like, how did that happen? This is how it happened. OK? So that's water hammer. Um, incidentally, you know, where this shows up in, your, in houses, they may have, this may be rare now, but it certainly was, I, you know, as a kid, I know this, our house did this. Washing machines turn on and off the flow of water very abruptly uh, in general. And if the plumbing is set up so the column of water is moving towards the washing machine, and then the washing machine turns off the flow, Abruptly, you, get, you can get water hammer in the pipes. And the pipes go blah, 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 blah. Maybe this is rare now, particularly with you know, plastic pipes. You, you, you can design the piping so that there's an air pocket that, that cushions the impact. Prolong, it spreads out the, the transfer of momentum over seconds, or, over, or a good chunk of a second, rather than a thousandth of a second. So that, that gets rid of it. But if you've ever in a, been in a house where you hear the plumbing rattle periodically, as things are turned on and off, it's the water hammer. All right? Yeah, Dave? Yeah. During the, the first half, the bottle is moving downward, leaving the water behind inertially, and it creates a vacuum at the bottom and compressed air at the top. And that imbalance in, imbalance in pressures uh, resolves itself later by throwing the water toward the bottom of the bottle, where it overtakes the bottom of the bottle and knocks it out. Uh, Sam? If you had the bottle upside down, could you do the like, could, If you had the bottle upside down, could you pop the top? I think the problem there is that there's no air bubble at the bottom then. But I have seen people knock the corks out of wine bottles using this. You gotta, I think it's done, you got to do it horizontally. Um, but you can't, and I forget, with a shoe and a wine bottle, you can, you can so you, when you hit stuff, you don't break the bottle on the, on the wall, but you can knock, you can get water hammer to punch the, uh, the, the cork out. I forget exactly how, how to arrange it, I can't think of it offhand. When you're totally desperate, to, you gotta have the wine. All right, it's better than breaking the neck off. All right, 
So that's the world of, uh, of garden watering and this flow of water. What I'm going to move on to now is, is the flow of air around stuff. And the, really, the, the one that matters most in, in your everyday life is, is the flow of air around objects. You included, but, 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 but you can focus on a smaller object, balls. So, so that's my story of, of balls and air. And I don't really need this right hand. Do I have it right here? Remind myself of what, if, if anything, I want to ask you about. OK. Um, when air flows around a ball, and now let me get a big ball to play with, it undergoes uh, changes in its direction of travel. It, you know, it's got to go around the ball, so it can't go straight. So it does have to bend. The flow, pieces of the flow bend. And as I talked about last time with, uh, with water and a hose going around a bend, if, if, a, if a fluid is, 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 is curving, its flow, it does this by way of a pressure gradient. There's a pressure, the pressure is different on, one, on the outside of a turn than it is on the inside of a turn. In fact, it's always higher on the outside of the turn, lower on the inside of the turn. That's what bends the path, that pressure gradient. All right, so that shows up all over the place in the flow of air around balls. Now, okay, I'm talking about balls, but, you, but this, this very easily goes over to the flow around any other object flow of air around any other object, including cars, which is the topic of, of the problem set that is due not this Friday, but a week from Friday. The flow of air around a car, you, you've, you've lived in that environment your whole life, and here's, here's, here's the, how it works. OK, so if you want, we want to look at the flow of air around a ball. Normally, the ball is moving through the air, I mean, to the, to the view of people sitting in the stands watching the game, whatever game it is. Uh, for simplicity, we'll take a different perspective. We'll, we'll be the ball. We'll, we'll, we'll move with the ball and watch the air go by. And this is particularly relevant if you're, like, if you're a runner, for example, um, and you're a you know, runner or a swimmer and going by fluids. If you're running along and the air is coming at you, this is the way that you will perceive the, the, the flow and how it affects you. So as the air comes along, and let's see, to be consistent with my, with my drawings, if I want to put up a drawing, because some of these are hard to visualize. That's, how did this happen? There it is, okay. I will, so here, here's the ball the air coming at it from the left heading toward the right. So that's either the air is coming, is moving to the right past the ball, or the ball is moving to the left through the air. Same physics. And as the air encounters the ball, it spreads. And I will now be unusual here and, and, and use this uh, image. The air spreads around to go around the ball, because it can't go through the ball. It has to, it has to bend. It then bends toward the ball to sort of wrap around it, and then it bends away at the end to leave. This flow pattern, this is, this is the flow pattern of steady state flow in air, simple laminar flow. Um, basically, we've seen this sort of situation before in a couple other contexts with water. Now it's with air. Uh, just to point out, the flow of air and the flow of water are very similar in almost every circumstance. There, there are differences. In, there are differences in the numerical values of things. Like air has a much smaller viscosity, and it has a, a significantly smaller density. But otherwise, yeah, it's a flow. Is a flow. Uh, one exception, and I'll say it, and then we'll let, we'll forget about it. That is, air can be compressed. You can pack air more tightly and change its density. You can't do that with water, um, you know, without explosives or something. You can't pack water more tightly. It's incompressible. Air is compressible. That makes air a little more complicated. Fortunately, as long as you're not throwing supersonic fastballs, the fact that, that air is compressible can be ignored. Even with airplanes, we can mostly ignore air's compressibility. It's not a big deal. So I'll just set it aside, forget about it. Yeah? In this store, as I've got it with these arrows here, these are the arrows of the flow. This, this, this arrow is saying the flow is moving to the right. 
which means that either the, air, the ball is sitting still and having a wind come at it from the door, or we're in stationary air, which is now, and I'm moving the ball to, the, to your left. Is that okay? And, and what happened, th this flow is beautifully symmetric. Um, the, the, the air bends away at, at the beginning to go around. It bends toward the sides. I, I struggle always to get a name for this, like maybe the girth of the ball or something. And then it bends away from the ball as it leaves. And, and just to try to give you an, an understanding of how that affects pressure. For air to bend away from the ball, so the air was coming along here trying to go straight, and suddenly it's forced to bend up and uh, to go over the ball. That bend is a turn around a center. Where's the center of the turn? It's the oh. How am I even, oh, I am talking to this stupid thing. I'm so glad to be using technology again. All right, don't touch that. Okay, for the air to bend like this, it's bending sort of around a center. The center is up here somewhere. It's, it's a curve, right? And the curve, the center of the curve is, is out here. It, we know which way it's accelerating. It's accelerating towards that, the, the green dot as it goes around the turn. And for that to happen, it has to be pushed toward the green dot. It's being pushed away from the ball. And that means there's a pressure gradient in the air. The pressure has to be higher near the ball than it is far from the ball in order to push the air away like that. You, you okay with that idea? That pressure difference, okay, it, it, we, we know at this point that there's a relative difference in pressure. This is higher pressure than that. Do we have, an, do we have a, a, a specific value anywhere? Yes. Once you get far enough away from the ball, the, the, the air doesn't even know the ball's there. It's just atmospheric pressure air. So far from the ball, the pressure is always atmospheric. And if the pressure is higher near the ball than it is far from the ball, the pressure near the ball is above atmospheric pressure. And it, it, this is, it really is. If you went in there, if you were a bug sitting on the ball right there with your little barometer measuring the, measuring the pressure and reporting the weather station, you know, you say, wow, it's high pressure air here. It's above atmospheric. 43 inches of mercury, Joe. You know, all right, I don't know who Joe is. Uh, short for Josephine. Anyway, this is high pressure air. And in my convention, it's on the violet end of the spectrum in color. I'm showing you high pressure air here is violet. Uh, incidentally, the, to, to obtain this higher pressure, the air had to slow down. It had to convert kinetic energy into pressure potential energy. So the air is moving slower here. It's actually, the streamlines are spread out as the air slows down and, and it sort of packs, um, fills a wider space. So this is low speed, high pressure air. As the air goes around the sides of the, of the ball, that entire girth, it's accelerating toward the ball to make that bend. The center, the center of this turn here is somewhere in the ball. So it's being pushed towards the green dot uh, in order to accelerate toward the green dot. So the pressure near the surface of the ball has to be higher than far away from the ball. Again, far away from the ball, it's atmospheric pressure. So the pressure right near the ball is less than atmospheric pressure. It's a partial vacuum there. Again, if you were a bug on that part of the wall, ball, um, you would notice with your little barometer, oh, it's low pressure. Probably a hurricane coming, guys. It's you know, bad news. Uh, incidentally, it's also to, to, to develop that low pressure, the air had to put its energy into another form. It's not pressure potential energy anymore. It's kinetic energy. That's fast moving air. So the bug is, the bug is there gripping a, a, a post, trying not to get blown away, or at least pretending not to get blown away, right? Anyway. Um, so that's low pressure, high speed air. And to leave the, the, the back of the ball, the air has to, to bend away from it again in order not to just pile up here at the back of the ball. So the air again accelerates away from the ball. So the pressure out here is, uh, is lower than the pressure over here. It's to push the air away. So this is above atmospheric pressure again, purple again. So it goes from purple, violet, high pressure air to red end of the spectrum, which is low pressure air, back to violet, which is high, high pressure air. Is that okay? That is the flow around a ball if the flow can stay laminar the whole way. 
And it's so symmetric that everything, everything cancels perfectly in terms of pressure. There's high pressure in front of the ball where the, ball, where the air hits. There's high pressure behind the ball where the air leaves. And they cancel. They push equally hard on opposite sides of the ball. The low pressure here is canceled by the low pressure there. They push equally hard. This and this, all cancel. There is no force due to pressure on the ball in this, in this situation. It all cancels out. Is that OK? And I can't, and here I am in the dark again. I just want to come back to, to less dark. That means that if, if the flow around the ball, if, if I'm running along here, okay, the flow around the ball can stay laminar. The flow will, will spread, flow around, and heal at the back perfectly. And there will be no forces on the ball due to pressure. The ball will go through perfectly. With, um, with almost, so far, with, with no interaction with the air. Like, it does not push on by the air at all. It, this was a puzzle, actually, for a while. I think called D'Alembert's paradox or something. Uh, the early people studying this, uh, in the, the early years of aerodynamics and stuff, thought, wow, the ball should move through perfectly without any air resistance. So where would, there, where would air resistance come from? In this context, it will show up because the air does rub on the surface by way of viscosity. So they're, they're, you do have to pay to move the ball through the air or the air past the ball. They do interact a little bit because of the syrupiness of air, modest though it is. And so the ball is pushed downwind slightly. As the air goes by, it rubs on the surface, and it tries to drag the ball with the air. And that force is called a drag force. Drag forces are down, downwind, downstream, in the direction of the flow. Those are, those are what are known as drag forces. Fancy name for air resistance. What, you, what, you're, fami what you're familiar with is air resistance. In this case, it's a drag force caused by viscosity alone. And so it's called a viscous drag force. All right? As opposed to what? As opposed to pressure dr drag force, which I'll come to in a minute. So every from everything I've told you at this point, the ball experiences a down stream force, a drag force, due to viscosity, and so it's known as a viscous drag force. Having told you that, this is not an appropriate story for most balls. Why? Because most balls move too fast through the air, or the air moves too fast past them. Its viscosity is so dinky that it goes turbulent. So this perfect flow that I've described to this point you just don't see it in, in balls in air. Too, they're too big, the obstacle, too big an obstacle. The air flow is too fast. The density is density, density small, but the viscosity is too little. So do you ever see this? Well, you certainly see it with water. It, it happens, if I had water flowing around a ball and went slowly, this is what we would see. Um, so boats try to operate this way if they're, you know, a canoe maybe would try to operate like this. Uh, the canoe doesn't look like a ball, but it's pretty close. You know, just, just stretch it. Where this shows up in the air is with very small things moving through the air, little obstacles. So the viscosity, the air's pitiful, weak viscosity is still able to keep the flow laminar. And that, so this is the world of dust and ash and clouds and fog and germs. <laughs> You know, when you sneeze and you, you, you spray your, yeah, it's college, right? Everybody's spraying it at you. All, all these diseases go flying through the air. You know, what's, why do, let's just stick with something like a piece of ash, a little teeny, it, it's, it's a little piece of rock. And if I took a big chunk of rock and dropped it, it would hit the ground fast, right? Thunk. It's, it's not buoyant. It's, you know, it's, it's not supported by the buoyant force. A piece of rock falls, plop. But if you make it really, really dinky, it's still rock. But because it's so small, it has almost no inside, and therefore very little weight. And yet it has a lot of, relatively speaking, a lot of outside to interact with the air. So it experiences a lot of viscous drag. And so, so the point of this is the little stuff in life, the teeny tiny stuff, uh, experiences viscous drag force. It, it has laminar flow around it. The flow is perfect, like I've just described. Um, and so the pressures balance out beautifully. But the 
viscous drag force is still there. You can't get away from that. The flow of the, over the surface, of the, of the air over the surface rubs. And so it's pushed. It, it experiences, therefore, a downstream, downwind drag force, viscous drag. And for a, a tiny piece of rock that you drop up here, as it starts to, to descend, initially it accelerates downward at the acceleration due to gravity. It's a piece of rock, okay? But as it starts to move through the air, and the laminar flow goes around it, because it's so dinky, it experiences more and more viscous drag force. And the viscous drag force increases, gosh, I should know this. I think it increases linearly with speed. You double the speed through the air, you get twice as big a force. Uh, so the, the rubbing gets worse as it goes faster, and it, it, it very quickly hits the famous terminal velocity. I think we talked about that early in the semester. Uh, at terminal velocity, that, piece, that tiny piece of rock is experiencing the same upward, uh, is an upward viscous drag force that equals, that cancels the little piece of rock's weight. And that force on the piece of rock then is zero. And it, and it coasts, it's inertial. That's terminal velocity when it, when it gets to that point. And it does speed up for a while until it, until it negotiates the right, you know, the right speed, the right drag force, and, and no faster. And so it, it, little, little pieces of rock and, and plant matter and everything else, water droplets and clouds, they are, they are descending. If the air were truly still, they will gradually make progress through the air. But they'll come down at millimeters per, per second or less, tiny speeds. Uh, you know, from experience, you close the door, and you have a room that, that has no ventilation or something like that, you close the door and wait a, wait a day and all the dust that was in the air will slowly work its way through the air and land it on all the flat surfaces. Uh, but if you have any breezes in the air, it, it whips the, air, the dust back up and swirls it around. So they're all experiencing viscous drag forces that are delaying their descent. Is that okay? All right, so what about the world of, of, of real balls? They're going too, they're going too fast to, 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 to remain in laminar flow. So what happens? So, so let me show you this drawing, and because I can, and hopefully it's, it's helpful. For, for a real ball moving at, at realistic speeds, it's too big and moving too fast through the air to stay laminar, so you get turbulent flow, turbulent flow is certainly possible. What causes it and where does it show up? Well, again, the air is still heading toward the right around this ball. It bends away from the front surface, same as before, because nothing bad's happened yet. The air bends toward the surface on the sides of the ball, and then it has trouble going to the back of the ball. And to give you an idea of why there's trouble there, in, in the, or the original drawing, the air the pressure of the air on the girth of the ball was low, and the pressure of air at the back of the ball was high. So the air is doing a weird thing. It's going from low pressure to high pressure. It's flowing into, a, into a, something that's pushing it backwards. It's being pushed backwards by the pressure gradient. So it's slowing down. And it can do this. It, you know, it is possible for air to flow the wrong way into, into rising pressure, but it will slow down. And it's, gonna be, it's gotta make it all the way. In this case, it's gotta make it all the way to the back without running out of forward momentum. And that, that does happen for the little dust particles and stuff like that. It doesn't happen here. The problem is that the air, the air far from the ball, medium far from the ball, which is doing all the bends, is okay. But the air very close to the ball is rubbing against the ball. It's experiencing the viscous stuff. And that air that's, that experiences viscous interactions. Um, there's a question asking, if the ball and the air are moving at the same speed, in that case, they're just moving together, and the air is just around the ball. There's no, there are no interactions at all. They're just sitting there uh, from, from the perspective of somebody riding the ball, and, and so you don't get any of these drag forces. Okay, so, so as the air goes around the, 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 the back of the ball, that, that layer that's rubbing, that is aware of the surface. It's got a name, it's called the boundary layer. And the, how, how thick the boundary layer depends on the context and the situation. For, for a ball, a normal ball moving through the air, it's, it's, it's in the millimeters range. The, the air that is, that is rubbing on layers of air that are rubbing on layers of air that are rubbing on layers of air that are rubbing on the ball. 
those, there's, a, there's a fall off in interaction as you get farther from the ball until you get to the point where the, the air is a, oblivious to the presence of the ball. That innermost air, the boundary layer air, rubs, and it, it, it's got a double, double whammy. It's, it, it's not only is it being pushed backwards by the rising pressure in front of it, but it is rubbing, and it runs out of momentum. It doesn't make it to the back of the ball. And once it stops, which it does, um, it ruins steady state flow. You can't have steady state flow where the air or the liquid, the fluid coming along travels along merrily and then stops. You can't do that. That's not steady state. It piles up there. So the, the air piles up here and it, it creates a wedge that, that shaves the flow off the back of the ball. And the, the flow then outside of a certain region is still laminar, but inside that region, which is cylindrical incidentally, this is just a slice through it, it's a cylinder that's all turbulent, swirly mess. And that air is not moving very fast anymore, and its, air pressure, its pressure is pretty much atmospheric. So the problem here then is the, the, the air at the back of the ball is a big turbulent wake or air pocket. And because it's basically brought to the same speed as the ball, there is a big change in momentum. The air has given up its, the momentum it used to have to the ball and is now stopped. It's traveling with the ball. So the ball, was pushed, it's, the ball is pushed downwind. It's a drag force. And this drag force is called pressure drag as opposed to viscous drag because one way to look at where it comes from is that the pressure is no longer balanced. There's still high pressure in front of the ball but there's no, low, there's no high pressure behind the ball anymore. It's a mess, it's atmospheric pressure there. And you've, you've played with this pressure drag every time you hold your hand out in the wind or stick it out the, the, the passenger window of your car and, and try to catch bugs as they go by. You, you, you feel your hand being pushed backwards. That's pressure drag. The air pressure in front of your hand is high as the air is bending to go around it. It's low on the sides of your hand and then in the back, swirling mess at atmospheric pressure. So you have an unbalanced high pressure in front of your hand that's pushing your hand downwind. Is that okay? Uh, just to finish this off in something vaguely interesting here, uh, you can see pressure drag in, in action. If I send air around the ball, there's high pressure where the air hits the ball, low pressure on the sides, and then swirling mass on the back. And I can do that. The ball was being supported by pressure drag. I was shooting the air up. The air was developing high pressure under the ball, nothing on top. That pushes up on the ball. So it was being supported by pressure drag. The other cool thing is that it gets, the ball gets sucked into the airstream because if it tries to leave the airstream, the side that's, that's still in the airstream has that, that, that nice curve toward the, toward the ball. And that curve is associated with low pressure. So whatever side of the ball is still in the, in the airstream develops low pressure, and the ball gets pushed in that direction, toward that, back into the airstream. So it's, it's stable. It sits there pop, bobbing around in the airstream, always uh, is a, essentially a stable equilibrium. It, up and down, it, 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 it's, it's negotiating just the right drag force. To the sides, it wants to be in the airstream. You do the same thing with spoons. You know, a, a dangling spoon with water going across its curved face will get sucked into the, air, into, the, into the flow the same way. All right, so call it a day and uh, do the rest of balls on Friday. <laughs> <laughs>